start with Sarah talking about our prayer time.
here all the days of the week. And I think everybody has a different day. Bill, what were you saying? I'm just saying, I think I prefer the hard copy. I mean, we can have our corporate prayer, our prayer together on Sunday, like right. we normally do, but then we could carry it into the week individually. Yeah. Kathy, we definitely have our prayer during prayer time. So um, we could, and we would coordinate. So if I were to bring something next week on, let's say, hope, then Kathy could incorporate that moving forward. And if people wanted to stay after, as Rudy suggested, we could do that too. John Riley, I don't think you were done talking. Were you done? Not really. Okay. I'm never done. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were saying everything sure. makes a different problem for everybody. What about everything? Thank you, please. What? what about doing everything you mentioned? <laughs> Okay. 
Yeah, that's pretty good. Good. Somebody is coming back. Okay. Actually, Peace moved in the same group, wants to come back next week. Okay. And she gave me a date on Monday, surprised me. Thanks, John, for taking leadership of that for us so that it gets handled. All right. Um, I think that's all. Any other announcements? That was plenty. Let's ready our hearts for worship with Rudy.
Thank you, Rudy. It's beautiful, as always. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a few moments confessing our sins and our brokenness before God in silence. mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
His hand is heavy despite my burning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. There an upright person could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there, or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness, and thick darkness would cover my face. Please stand as you're eager for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. 
As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or field for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. You. Will you take a minute and pray with me this morning? Father, thanks for your word. And I confess my distractions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. This week's been hard. I got news that a good friend's father passed away after a, a hard relationship and then COVID. It's been a rough week. It's been a busy week, talking to Gretchen this morning. It's been busy, right? It's a busy season. Feels like there's a lot going on. So I just wanted to pray that we could, we could focus. The Lutheran Church is a liturgical church, and that means we follow a liturgy. It's the script of how we celebrate together, as a church on Sundays especially, but also for ceremony and, and all of the special holidays. And it means that we use this book, this book that Aaron declares gigantic called the lectionary. And the lectionary sets readings for us every week on a cycle that repeats every three years. So we get all the Gospels and we get lots of selection and in context. The reading from Mark today comes after the reading from Mark last week. And we know that all the liturgical denominations that are using the lectionary, whether they're Lutheran or not, are reading the same Gospel. But when it comes to the other readings, like our reading from Job today, there are options, usually four-ish. Some from the Old Testament, some from the New, some prophets, some stories, some New Testament epistles. I don't know how other people who preach decide between all of the options, but I start reading them at the beginning of the week and just waiting and seeing what God shows me. Today there was a lovely passage I would have really liked to preach from that was all about seeking God's justice and seeking good and hating evil, and I love those scriptures. They're my favorites. But that is not what God had planned this week. Had it all typed up, I was ready. Not so much. Today we get Job, because that's a fun story. We know Job's story. God points him out to Satan and says, look! 
You see, Job, he's great. He's blameless. He's faithful. He hates evil. And Satan's like, really? Really? He has a really good life. Of course he loves you. Let me mess with him. And so God says, well, you can't kill him, but okay. And Satan begins to tear apart Job's bubble. And the rest of the 42 chapters, because the first two, by the, end, by the midway through chapter 2, Job's life is a disaster. And the rest of the chapters are a conversation between Job and these guys that my Bible calls his friends. And eventually, at the end, God chimes in. There's praying, and there's mourning, and there's blaming, and there's a lot of trying to figure out why bad things happen. It's, it's pretty real and pretty raw. And today's reading is from chapter 23, so smack in the middle, and Job is wondering where God is. And he sounds like a little kid to me, wishing from the, from the safety of their bedroom that they could really just let their parents have it. Right? Were you ever that kid? I was that kid. I really wanted to, like, tell my mom a thing or two, right? And now I have teenagers, so I'm sure they feel the same way. The, the paraphrased version of the Bible called The Message paraphrases this section as Job saying, If I knew where on earth to find him, I'd go straight to him. I'd lay my case before him face to face. I'd give him all my arguments firsthand. I'd find out exactly what he's thinking, discover what's going on in his head. Do you think he'd dismiss me or bully me? No, he'd take me seriously. I thought that was very teenager-like. Job talks about how God wants what God wants, when he wants it, and then Job admits at the end of our scripture that God scares him. So after days of hearing his friends blame him for his disaster of a life, telling him he must deserve this because he must have sinned, a sin that he just is unaware of or is unwilling to confess, he makes this plan or maybe just a wish in his head that he's going to head straight into God's office, ask him what he's thinking and set him straight. If only he knew where God's office was. So I want to know, and, and this is going to be one of those sermons where I ask you questions and expect you to answer, so I hope you're paying attention. Liz gave me a thumbs up, so I'm going with it. She better answer. What do you think at this point Job is actually feeling? Abandonment? Abandonment? Betrayal. He's mixed up. I didn't hear what somebody else said. Betrayal. Betrayal. Anything else? A little bit of doubt. A little bit of doubt. I was thinking confusion. Also, a little bit of arrogance. Arrogance? He needs reward because he's been good. Right? He really has been blameless.
So let's leave Job and look at the Gospel reading out of Mark. Last week we heard Pastor Julie tell the story. Jesus had just finished saying that we must receive the kingdom of God like little children. And then the rich man comes along. And when he approaches Jesus, he kneels before him. What do you think he's feeling? That's how you get stability. That's how opportunity comes. 
The rich man is so capable of providing for himself and for being a good religious man that he has no need for God in the world or probably in eternity, he thinks. His ability to follow the rules, much to his sadness, is not the way to the kingdom, and he walks away. So what do we think he's feeling then? Discouraged. Discouraged. Hopeless. Hopeless. Confused. I think you really wanted the answer to be follow the commandments and you're in. Yeah. The bad news for the rich is the good news for the poor. You can't depend on your goodness, your acts, your bootstraps, your wealth when it comes to eternal life. The kingdom doesn't depend on my bank account or my retirement. It depends on bringing our whole heart before Jesus. The come and follow me, but you have to let go of other things first. The kingdom is found in total dependence on God, not on self. The kingdom is to be received as a child receives gifts with joy and thanks and humility. I was reading a commentary this week about this scripture and it said, the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice Jesus demanded of this man is not meant to be applied to all. Well, that's convenient. It's a nice cop out to say, I guess that's not what the Lord wants for me. Because he didn't tell me that. But okay, if it's not truly an assignment for all of us, because I respect my commentaries, they're smart people, then we need to ask ourselves why Jesus would tell the man to do this in the first place. What would selling everything accomplish? I think it takes away the thing the man depends on most. It would make him helpless. Helpless, broken, last in line is exactly where we need to be so we see our need for Christ. And I think we have to ask ourselves, what is our crutch? What do we love more than God, depend on more than God? And so what does Jesus ask us to give up so that our dependence on God is complete? The man gets it sort of half right. He comes to Jesus and kneels. He knows to approach Jesus at all, which for a religious, powerful, wealthy man is significant. So he must have known something was missing. He knew Jesus had the answer, and he knew he had to follow the laws, and Jesus loved him. But when he couldn't come wholeheartedly to Jesus, that became the problem. So can we? One of the other readings this week was in Hebrews 4, so I'm going to cheat and read that part now. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we have been, and yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the word is sharp and piercing and dividing. It judges our thoughts and intentions. If the story of the rich man tugs at your heart, we have to ask God why. Maybe you know there's a relationship that's unhealthy or an addiction that's unhealthy or just laziness, or maybe it really is money that we're too attached to. And when you can answer that question, you know what, that Jesus is piercing your heart, and you know what you're holding too tightly to. And I think we have to ask that as a family. I think we should ask it as a church. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing was hidden from him. Everything is laid bare. So we might as well admit it. And these verses in Hebrews say that our great high priest Jesus understands our weakness. Because he understands our weakness, he understands our temptation, and he understands our brokenness, and we can come to him with boldness. I 
love that verse. Because it means I can come to him with my anger and my disappointment and my confusion. All those things that we said Job and the rich man were feeling. We don't have to hide our struggles. We don't have to fix our language or come before him in some magically correct way. We get to come to him in prayer exactly as we are. Like Job with a radical plan to storm the office, or like the rich man kneeling before the humble, the good teacher. We get to come. And like Job, I hope we come seeking the Lord and ready to burst out with whatever we're feeling and then listen and be changed. Because if we do so wholeheartedly, honestly, with our fears and our anxieties and our dependencies and our brokenness all hanging out like Hebrews says, then we too can receive mercy and find grace as help in our time of need. Amen.
Sarah's mentioned that during our prayer time, we're going to focus. I might do things a little differently. This week will be a little different. I don't know what we'll do in the future. We'll see. While Pastor Sally's gone, we want to focus on community and on Pastor Sally and her sabbatical. And as a way to do that, after I start with Psalm 90, I'm going to mention some aspects of our community and our time. And I'm going to pause. And if you feel so led, join me in praying for that thing. And if not, I'll leave some silence and we'll pray silently together. I haven't scripted it. It'll be okay. I'm going to start with a section from Psalm 90 because it's a beautiful prayer of a community crying out to God. And I'm going to read the, the message of the version, the message. I'm using it twice today. I didn't mean to do that. So let's pray. Oh, teach us to live well. Teach us to live wisely and well. Come back, God, how long do we have to wait? Treat your servants with kindness for a change. Surprise us with love at daybreak, and then we'll skip and dance all day long. Make up for the bad times with good times. We've seen enough evil to last a lifetime. Let your servants see what you're, you're best at, the ways to rule and bless your children. And let the loveliness of the Lord our God rest on us, confirming the work that we do. Amen. Let's take a moment and pray for our youth and children. Let's pray for our ill and our homebound. Let us pray for Pastor Sally and Michael.
Lord, we pray that they are restored and refreshed on a daily basis during this time. Let's pray for our presence and outreach in this neighborhood. Holy God, accept the prayers that we lift before you today. Hear our mouths. Listen to our hearts. And don't stay silent in front of us. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Holy Comforter, all God's people said, Amen. Come ye this come. So late
take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us now join together in praying the prayer of our Savior taught us. Our Love and serve.
serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.